All right, I think we are going live out to the Facebook world. Uh, good morning. How's good everybody? morning. <laughs> As the multitudes cheer, Facebook Live. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is great. And actually, Ron, this isn't uh, entirely too different from our our days, is it? <laughs> no, or our or our meetings. This is great. Exactly. It's We're like about to that. dance around the room. Dance around the room. Dance around the room. <laughs> I think the only difference right now is that I actually took a shower and put on a collared shirt um, instead of wearing a t-shirt and a ball cap like uh, all day every day. So. Yeah, it's it's you know it's always a good thing. Yeah. Every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, but uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is David McGee, and uh, normally you've seen our friend Joel Barnes hosting this um, Coffee with Enlace on, on Facebook Live here on Tuesdays and Thursdays mor Thursday mornings. Uh, but this morning we decided to mix it up a little bit, and so uh, Ron and I are going to be chatting. Uh, basically, I'm going to be interviewing Ron. So, um, all, most of you probably know Ron. Ron's a uh, co-founder and, and executive director of Enlace, and it's been, what are we going on, 26, seven years now? 27 years this year, right? Yeah, long time. Long time. And uh, so, and, and as you all know, um, we are in an interesting scenario right now um, with everybody in the stay-at-home orders. Um, and as Enlace, uh, there's been a lot of changes happening. Um, you know, Ron and I have been in a ton of different meetings with different staff members uh, over over the past few weeks as we've all been in stay-at-home orders. Um, but first of all, I wanted, Ron, for you to kind of explain to us a little bit how Enlace has kind of made a, a shift or a pivot in recent weeks. And, and, you know, for me, it's just interesting because we have always considered ourselves, and we are, a community development organization. Um, that looks at long-term community transformation. Um, but during this season, there definitely has been a need to, to kind of pivot and change a little bit. So um, why don't you just tell us all a little bit about how that pivot is happening and specifically even how your role as, as a leader in, in, at Enlace right now and how other leaders in the organization have had to kind of make a, a, a different shift or pivot over the last few weeks. Well, I think like most people, uh, this virus has kind of shocked us. Although we, you know, kind of been hearing some news, you know, from China, real far away, and then Europe, you know, when it becomes real, when it gets, uh, you know, down into our countries, um, it seemed to have come on us quickly. Um, and because of that, I think the first couple of weeks, like most leaders, and in fact, most pastors in El Salvador, and I think most uh, leaders in the States and, and everywhere else, even, even household, you know, parents, uh, responding in the same way kind of the first reaction is to go okay wait a minute let's protect what's ours we immediately try to think through okay who was going to be most exposed people on buses in El Salvador our staff you know who field staff so we immediately within uh, two days I uh, made an executive de decision even before the government did to close down the offices to protect our people uh, we tried to get everybody enough time to get home and hunker in and get the supplies they needed and and so your your our original focus is the first you know 10 12 days like kind of protecting our own, uh, figuring out what we need to do to kind of make it through this, uh, this crisis. But I think this crisis has been so different than most other uh, crises for us. And we've been through earthquakes and hurricanes and we've done you know, emergency relief in Guatemala, El Salvador, Nepal. I mean, this is, you know, in the countries we're at, and especially in the communities we work in, it's, it's a normal thing for there to be natural disasters, flooding or whatever that we're responding to continuously. But in this particular crisis, it's been so different. Uh, we didn't have enough information. It's silent. You can't just attack it right away. Um, we, it, we, the virility and how it's being transmitted and how it's just closed down everything has just been uh, really a a destabilizing, I think, for many people, and, and us included. So it really took us the next, after those first couple of weeks of protecting ourselves, it took a couple of weeks just to go, okay, what, what's going on here? Um, you know, how can we respond when we're at home? How can we help pastors right now, uh, you know, who can't go out? Um, you know, we could pray with them. We could talk to them. But, you know, is this going to be a six-month deal? Is this a 12-month deal? Is this a – I mean, how long is this? And I think because everyone has been kind of in that mode of, of survival, it, it took us a while to go, no, wait a minute. This, this is going to impact El Salvador for the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. Um, and hopefully the virus kind of works its way through. We're hoping, you know, eight, nine months. And, you know, and the, and the kind of the health infrastructure is – 
is flat enough to be able to respond. But we still know that the most vulnerable families out there are already being affected uh, by the virus, and that impact will go into the 12, 18 months. So as in last year, we've started now realizing we've got to pivot. Uh, like you said, we're not pivoting our mission or what we do, our core values or strategy. But we've got to now, as the leaders and as staff, say, how can we help pastors to look now and understand the situation, focus on the situation, but also help them plan out how to look mm -hmm. out? What, what are those factors going to be? Mm -hmm. So we're, like I said, we're using the same exact approach, the same methodology. Our strength is our deep relationships with pastors and leaders who are embedded in communities, working with community leaders. So the idea is how do we help pastors then shift and all of us turn towards going from being kind of protected and, and figuring out how we protect our own, our own staff, our own family, to now saying, no, wait a minute, we were built to equip churches to transform their communities. And, and yeah. how can we pivot our minds and our thinking to say, hey, how can we now move our staff into thinking what, how, what is the best way to help these yeah. pastors over the next 12, 18 months? So it's That's been a real pivot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, I, yeah. I think we're only five weeks into this thing and I feel like we're already three weeks behind. And, and as a leader, I keep pinching myself like, well, why, why did it take me so long to, to kind of pivot into mission? Why, why do we spend so much time looking and I think it's just naturally the way that uh, this, uh, specifically this crisis um, is shaping our understanding of who we are as people, as leaders in our household, our leaders in our business. And I think for me, the, the sooner you can pivot towards, wait a minute, what were we created for? Mm -hmm. what, what were we uh, intended to do uh, yeah. and be creative in doing that? Then I think it helps you as a leader kind of mobilize your team to say, okay, let's, let's pivot into mission then. Let's, let's move proactively into this situation. Yeah. And so, and, you know, thinking about, you know, the staff in, in El Salvador, Guatemala and Nepal, and, and, you know, for most of us, most of you know, you kind of have the, the, the field staff are kind of broken up in two areas of the church coaches and then the technical staff. And, you know, they're used to being out in the field on a, you know, on an ongoing basis. And I think that's what obviously makes uh, us unique in that it's a long-term accompaniment alongside of these pastors and church leaders. And now in all three countries, they are, um, you know, it's, it's the stay at home orders that are being pretty radically enforced. Um, and so they've had to go from being with and out in the communities on an ongoing basis to now just being, you know, enclosed um, in their homes, oftentimes in these urban settings. So what has the role of the staff been? Uh, how has the role of their, the staff changed in still trying to fulfill that, you know, mission of working with the community? How, what, what roles, what are they doing um, actively to, to, to kind of be able to identify the next steps? Well, even leading up to when we closed our offices, because the country hadn't been shut down yet, um, all of our church coaches were on the phone call, on the phone with, you know, doing WhatsApp or texting or, or calling pastors, church leaders, even community leaders, just checking in with them, how they're doing. And that kind of, that continues even to this day. We have prayer groups set up. We have uh, WhatsApp prayer groups that are by regions. Uh, pastors are talking to each other through Facebook. Um, in fact, some might be watching now. Like last time, Head of Song and them were on the Facebook watching, uh, uh, Facebook Live. So, uh, you know, the immediate response was, hey, these are our friends. Let's just care. Let's provide emotional support. Let's pray with them. Let's figure out what's happening. As things started rolling out and as the government started, like, kind of tightening up and then closing down, uh, in some cases, the government offered uh, subsidies. And in that case, the role of the the uh, church coaches and technical staff changed. Uh, in El Salvador, we literally, be, we turned our little laptops at home into call centers because to get the $300 subsidy, you had to be registered with your social security number in the system. And that, then you got a little ticket to, to where it told you where to go get it. Yeah. Most of the pastors and leaders we work with don't even have internet, much less could sit there for hours waiting. So what we did is they started literally just pumping out uh, people's ID numbers to our staff. And we, everybody's on there trying to get the numbers and help them try to do that the distribution or to get them that spot where they could go to get the money. In Nepal, it was different. Um, in Nepal, the municipalities were giving food uh, before they were in lockdown or right during that period of transition. And it was our uh, uh, church and coaches that actually worked with the mayor's offices or their municipalities there to actually work with community leaders to distribute food to those families that were not registered. In Nepal's case, there was people that were, did not have a, a tributary number and therefore weren't getting help. So they were able to mobilize food and get those families uh, care. In Guatemala, it's been a little different. Uh, the government's been going in after uh, lockdown hours. At, so at four o'clock, you can't go out in the street anymore in Guatemala. 
So the government comes in to give food packets. Well, a lot of those food packets are going to people that don't need it, and there's a lot being left behind. So the church community had been working with the calling the mayor's office and calling them saying, listen, you're missing these five families that are, you know, that are, that you need to get to and trying to figure out. And if not in Guatemala, they can leave in the morning. So they're giving food to those families, uh, kind of filling the gap. So their role has really gone from emotional and caring support, which is kind of continuous to really figuring out how they can connect uh, families to receive either government programs or government subsidies, and then filling in the gaps by providing food supplies and, and some other, other elements. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And, and so um, I know that there's been a lot of different plans being put in place and, and, and that you guys even with the El Salvador team and then in each country have actually formed like a, a, a tactical planning team to be able to lay out an, a, a, an exact strategy for how uh, they're going to be able to respond um, and, you know, and really about kind of equipping them to, to be poised and ready to respond in the most effective ways. Um, what are some of the practical ways that you're helping pastors or that have been laid out to help pastors prepare to respond to this crisis? Even, I think even you've been developing like a communication strategy there locally and how it's going to lay out or what are, what are the different ways that the church coaches are helping pastors to, to prepare to be poised and ready to respond to this? Well, the very first thing we're doing is trying to help pastors kind of go through the same process that we've been going through as a team. Um, there are pastors that are anxious, like, okay, what are we going to do? Let's get out there. You know, how are we going to respond? And there's other pastors still going, wait a minute, we don't, we can't go out. We don't know what to do, how to do this. And then there's pastors that are saying, we know we need to. And as soon as this opens up, we want to do something, but how do we really respond effectively? So the first step is to kind of just start a process with all the pastors and church leaders on reflecting. In fact, we're doing this with the community leaders as well. Um, get them reflecting on analyzing what are the, the people that are most vulnerable in your community, uh, really understanding them, identifying them, what are their needs, uh, but also seeing what, are the, what is the impact of this virus on those families in the short, in the medium, in the long term. And that analysis is not easy. Um, you know, for example, most farmers haven't started cultivating yet. They start farming in May when the rains come. So for them, they're like, well, we're assuming that everything will start farming again. And, you know, we'll have the inputs, the seeds, whatever. And then next year, next, you know, August, September, we'll sell our crops. And everything will be good. Well, we're helping them now go deeper into what the Ministry of, Ag of Agriculture is saying, uh, looking at supply chains. Are there going to be enough fertilizers and inputs in the country? Uh, it, it, are those that are most needed going to get the seed that they need? Is it going to affect sales on the back end? We're really trying to get pastors to think and community leaders to think about, okay, what are the short, medium, and long-term impacts? Uh, the way that we've started that is just a very practical way. We, I know this sounds maybe dorky, but we literally sent out a questionnaire um, and every church coach called the pastor and filled it out. And the idea was the questions were just very basic questions to get them thinking about who are those families? What are their needs now? What could their families be in 12, 18 months? Are you already coordinating with community leaders on understanding the problems? Have you called the mayor's office to see what they're going to do? Uh, do you have a plan in place just to get them talking and thinking like, okay, we need to get ready to do this. So the very first step was kind of understanding where the pastors were, get them ready, help them an analyze the situation. The next kind of step is really move them directly into calling their community leaders, working with their community associations. Once again, they're still at home. They most likely will be home till 15th or 18th of May, hopefully maybe longer, who knows. Um, but uh, so until they, they can leave, they're going to be calling their community leaders and calling um, community members, school leaders, school principals, um, uh, mayor's offices, local health clinics, and asking them, okay, do you have lists ready? Can you send us those lists to the community? Have you identified the most vulnerable? And then cross-checking those lists to make sure that no families are slipping through the cracks. So the next step is after helping them think is helping them identify those vulnerable families. But more than that, we, where the questionnaires are set up so that we can understand what is most needed in those families. Uh, some of these families are diabetic or have hypertension, and both of those situations make them extremely vulnerable uh, for, you know, for the virus. And many of them now have had five, six weeks that they've not been able to go to the doctor, not, they're not on their meds. Most don't have month supplies or can't go down to a pharmacy and just get six months supplies. So in their case, is there something immediate they need as far as medicine? Could we work with the health units to get medicine? Is it food, basic food supplies? Is it basic hygiene products, soap and, and, and different disinfectants and cleansers uh, for their houses? 
We're also working in many of the communities, the water boards have not been functioning because they don't have permits to go out on the street. So we've been working with the mayors to get them certified so they can continue to provide the clean water to the community. If you don't have clean water, why are you washing your hands, right? In other words, it's that basic. Uh, so really that next step is understanding who are the most vulnerable, what do they really need? And then the third step will be first address those immediate needs through what the government is already giving. Mm -hmm. So the government already has plans and we, we've got our staff now are just going through the websites and calling people at the Ministry of Agriculture, calling people to, at, at, the, at the international, all the food banks and the federal programs for food and food security. And we're doing all of our, our technical team, everyone's calling getting as much information so that we know what's gonna be offered, what the requirements are, so that none of these uh, vulnerable families can't uh, miss out just simply because they don't have some paperwork or they didn't photocopy something and they can't, they can't afford to go all the way back into the mayor's office you know, and, and spend three or $4 just on buses to get there and back because they, they, they forgot the one little right. document or something. Yeah. So the idea is to get all that really coordinated. So if you look at the steps, it's kind of a identify the vulnerable families, see what the government's doing, make sure the vulnerable families are being met in the short term, and then working with your community leaders and government to create long-term plans. Right. Um, with those long-term plans, they look a little different. Right. Um, we're already meeting with, for example, um, a small business owners, micro entrepreneurs. Uh, we're calling them and literally looking at their inventory and how much they have left and savings. How much is it gonna take to get back in to the game? When could they get back in? What kind of loan? Do they need to restructure their loan? Do they need to find a new loan? and work with them on that. So it's providing business training and loan stuff. Mm -hmm. But for agronomists, it's really uh, looking at who's gonna come in with how much are they gonna, uh, you know, how much seed do they need and how can we coordinate providing technical assistance and on the front end, maybe some inputs and on the back end, some sales. So all that's kind of happening um, as right. we prepare the churches. And the key thing right now, as you mentioned, is we're creating a series of six, it's over the next six weeks, each one of those five steps are gonna be laid out in, you know, two minute video messages from me or from the doctor, you know, Eva, who you met and other staff members through Facebook, through WhatsApp, through, and really get the, and this is going to go not only to church leaders, but also to community leaders. That's awesome. So the idea is that's going to be both kind of working together uh, to see how we can take those next steps. We're also creating a whole series of tools, um, you know, like an interview schedule for the mayor. How can you ask them five questions to know what they're doing and what they're going to prioritize mm -hmm. an interview schedule for the local health unit? You know, yes. do you have the diabetes medicines? Do you have enough, et cetera, et cetera. What are you guys doing? How can we help you? So the idea of, in, in all of this, once again, is to catalyze the local church right. to engage their community and care, identify and care for those most vulnerable. Yeah. And this is a, an amazing, uh, opera, you know, I, I I hate to even use the word opportunity when it's a crisis, a tragic crisis like this, because opportunity seems almost too positive a word. Uh, but it's an excellent um, a time for yeah. churches to pivot into mission right now. For those that have already been engaged over the last couple of years, worked with their community leaders, this is an amazing time for them to say, let's build on those relationships. Let's, let's build on the relationships we've already had with the mayor's office and with the Ministry of Ag. And let's build... You know, with, let's build off these relationships and together work to care for those families in Greece. Right. And what's, you know, just thinking about it from my perspective of, of being, uh, you know, when Jenny and I first went down to El Salvador, it was in 2002, which was like, you know, a year after the 2001 earthquakes and um, which was probably the most recent, most devastating um, uh, natural disaster uh, that hit El Salvador. But, you know, our whole concept of, of relief work um, and even the way in which, from what I understand, and Lasse was engaged in a lot of the relief work in 2001 and 2002, is kind of your typical relief of being outside entity, you know, picture the semi truck coming in, unloading materials for people that's kind of, you know, oftentimes in a fairly unorganized way in, in, for, for people to be able to receive this help. Um, what's so incredible right now is seeing the way in which the, these local pastors, church leaders, and community leaders who already have like that social infrastructure of being organized together, they're going to be the best and most efficient, you know, distribution points for being able to, to, to be able to, to create not only immediate relief, but an ongoing and long-term recovery. Right. Um, and it's just been neat for me because as, as I've always, you know, how many times have, have I talked about like the, the spiral 
um, and the church and community, uh, pro, you know, program and the process. And there's the one of the things that if, if you've ever been to El Salvador on a, on a vision trip or a mission trip, especially if you've been there with Ron, you've seen him <laughs> draw some circles and draw. All some right, spirals. Dave. All right. All right. Come on. No, we've all, we've all been doing it, you know, like, and that's part of what community development, you know, and Lasse's model is all about of church, church-based community transformation of equipping this local church. But we've always seen it. And me personally, I've always seen it in, in the realm of, of only being able to, to kind of do that long, arduous process of church and community working together, identifying, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and doing the sixth stage of discover, you know, uh, listen, organize, uh, partner, you know, incarnate, replicate, the little circle that turns into the spiral. Um, but you've usually seen that over the long haul. But what's interesting is it seems like right now there, that whole process is kind of being compacted into even through WhatsApp <laughs> and mm-hmm. through phone calls and through, you know, uh, Google Hangouts. They're literally doing the discovering and organizing stages and listening with church and community. So anyhow, it's just really, really neat to see the way in which um, not only have uh, the pastors and church leaders been stepping up, um, but that the, the staff themselves, the local staff in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nepal, that they have just, you know, they're stepping up. Uh, and everybody's adapting, right? Everybody has to adapt and pivot um, during this time. And so it's just, it's kind of, it's been an incredible process to see, you know, for me uh, personally so far. And yeah, I don't know, Ron, if you have anything else to say in terms of, of the way in which these pastors and church leaders or any even stories you were mentioning the the story in Nepal and uh, the way in which that they were able to engage with the with the community and actually provide immediate food and and resources for them um, you know at, at, at the very beginning of this crisis well I think one of the things that's neat um, is that you know we're I think we're five weeks into this thing or whatever it is five six weeks I don't know depending I guess which country uh, you were in uh, when it started but um, we're actually two months now into it with El Salvador now that I think about it. Uh, but it's, it's been interesting to watch that the, kind of the shift in the pastor's minds. And with the questionnaires going out over the last co- two weeks, you're getting a real hunger. The pastor's going, good, you know, we've been waiting to kind of figure out what we're going to do next. And we've been trying to do kind of, you know, shooting however we can and helping however we can. But, you know, we're so grateful that, you know, that now there's a plan. And then last is going to kind of come in and, and, and help us think through this. And we could, so most of the pastors, there's this growing excitement in the midst of obviously fear around them and anxiety. There's a growing excitement like, yeah, if we've got two, three weeks. If we can get on this on-ramp well, then when we're, we're freed up to move, we're going to be able to be really effective. And, and the thing about it is there's, it, it has to be that way. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think about it, in the majority of the communities we work in, there's anywhere between, what, 200 and 300 families. If you just do the simple math of that, we work in 250 communities in El Salvador, you know, add another 100 between Nepal and, and Guatemala. You know, if you just do the math, if you really, if, if 90% of those people are affected, which is what it is, uh, you, no matter how much money we raise in Alasi, I mean, it would take hundreds of millions of dollars to care for people in the front end and throughout the process. So at this point, for the church community to be really effective, they've got to really be uh, fine-tuned in understanding what organizations are already giving, what the mayor is going to be doing, what the federal government's going to be doing, and then how they can fill in gaps. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the Enlace can really be you know, a, a, an effective strategy is if we can raise some resources to just fill those gaps so that those families that are most need have the transition points or have for the second and third month after they didn't be, after they got the first month. And, but I think the, the, the necessity of the church to see their community um, leaders as ongoing partners and to embrace them and work with them um, as they build relationships with mayors on is critical or, or we're not going to be able to see the impact we need. Um, I mean, like I said, do the math. I mean, even if, so let's say, I mean, you can go very specifically and then I'll go back to the example of Nepal. But I mean, in a community of 250, um, in Nepal, the communities are a little bit bigger, but the municipality with and lastly, were giving food out to people that were registered. Well, the church could see that there was 50, 60 people, almost families in each community that they work with. And we work in uh, 29 or 30 communities in Nepal right now. They were seeing 20, you know, 50 people, 45, 50 people or somewhere out in that range that are either immigrants that have come from other states into that region and therefore aren't certified with that or aren't registered with that mayor's office. 
and or they're so poor that they haven't been able to renew their basic uh, uh, documents because they don't have you know transportation or they, they haven't been able to pay to get the, the the you know pay their fees to update the new registration. So you get those you get those uh, you always get those pockets of people falling. So the critical thing there is for the church community first to take all of the thing that they can get from the government, make sure that goes out well and to the right people, and then figure out which families are in need and work together. In Nepal, they did something really neat, I thought. was that What they did was, because they want to do it in a safe and dignified way, they didn't want to, you know, uh, highlight who could not afford to go get food. They have a window of four or five hours a day, maybe six hours a day, that they can go get food from the grocery store. So what the church and community leaders did is they would pick spots on the route of where these most valuable, uh, vulnerable families were, like if they were going to go shopping. They'd pick an empty lot on a corner and say, okay, it's there. Now pretend you're going to go shopping. They'd go over there, grab their bags, and then walk back into town like if they'd gone shopping. So the idea is even finding creative ways of really giving people dignity and, and you know, not you know, putting a big target on their backs. Oh, you know, why didn't you get this? Or you're not from here. Because in Nepal, you know, if you're not registered, and it, and it could mean that you're not from that area, that could generate certain persecution or even you know, some bad feelings against you because they're saying, why are you here in our town? So the idea is to protect people as much as possible. And to do it in a way that is safe, because obviously there was no was total social distancing. It was, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a block away than when they were dropping that food away. Uh, but also, um, it, it provided a way of, of really providing dignity to those families, you know, caring for them in a way that was not manipulative. It wasn't the church trying to convince. It wasn't done at the church on purpose so that they didn't feel like, oh, yeah, we've got to go, you know, subject to the church. Or their neighbors would say, oh, you're getting something from the church. Rather, they did it right where they were at in very strategic ways. And that's the, that's the brilliance of having, you know, a pastor, 150 church leaders connected to a community leader, you know, 10, 15 community leaders, five associations, you got 50 community leaders, and maybe 100 community. When you have, you know, 150, 200, 250 relationships that they've been working on together, it's so much easier to say, you know, how can we create these strategies to really care for people in the best way? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty incredible to see and how it's kind of unique in every country as well, you know, in the ways in which they're engaging. But yeah, well, and uh, you know, what we're going to be trying to do with this Coffee with Enlace on Tuesday, Thursdays um, is on Tuesdays, uh, we're going to kind of kind of follow this plan that Ron was just talking about of, of the different steps uh, in which the churches and communities are, are going to be engaging uh, in this relief and recovery process and start bringing on guests on Tuesdays from our staff or from from technical partners that are actually helping um, for helping these these plans to move forward, um, and so I'm really excited about that. I mean, we, we're going to have, you know, uh, Israel at some point who's going to focus on economic development. We've got Hessian de Leon that's going to be you know focused on what's going on in Guatemala and helping to identify the families in greatest need in both you know Salvador and Guatemala. And we also want to get Tina on uh, from Nepal, which will be incredible. I have to figure out the the hours with that whole thing. It's always interesting to connect with them over there. Um, but then on on top of that, so those are on Tuesdays. We're going to kind of be on the technical uh, vein of things, and then on Thursdays we we're, we're going to be still engaging more partners. Um, it's been incredible to have a few partners already on, um, and we look forward to 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 uh, having lots more people on. Um, and you know, and I forgot to actually bring the full on co- in Lasse mug, but of course we got always got to have your coffee. This one is not necessarily in Lasse mug, but it's actually a uh, Centro Cristiano de Impacto. And that's from, it's got the little waves. It's one of our churches, uh, partner churches in rural Salvador there along the coast. K59, little surf spot there um, called Chutia. Uh, but so anyhow, that's that was pretty awesome. It's one of my favorite lo- local church logos, right? With the that's awesome. Logo. Yeah, I need to get one of those. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't even think about it having my Lasse mug, but this is, Next best thing for sure. And I think, Dave, I think uh, people are starting to get in their coffee packages, right, today? Yeah. I know that my sister-in-law just got it, and I think Michelle walked out just now to see if the, our mail, uh, the mailman just brought it. So I, we're pumped. I think, uh, you know, for you that are starting to get it, please send us, uh, you know, posts. I think there's some hashtags coming out. I think it's in Lasse Coffee a Buzz or something like that. Is that right, Dave? Uh, I don't even a know. Hashtag. and ask Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> And I think the idea is, hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. We just got ours. Uh-uh. Yeah, we did. <laughs> no way. So as you can see, it's right here. Let me open it for you guys. I don't know if you guys can see this very well. But you can see that it should come like that with like an Elasse sticker on it, Elasse coffee. 
Nice. And since I think we were one of the first ones, I think there's a little bonus treat in here. I don't know if that's going out to everybody, but let's see. Oh, no. If, yeah, the bonus treat is going to be – well, yeah, we'll see. But we're going to do that, I think, for everybody who signed up in March and April. No, okay. April and May. Cool. So let me see what's in here. Can you see? Yeah. All right. So dun, 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 dun. an Aero Press. Dude, that's awesome. So you guys I will know. all get your own awesome Aero Press to do the coffee. And then uh, there's also in here the awesome bag of coffee right here that you'll be getting with the impact card. So if you can see the, the picture, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, get this closer here. And, uh, Dave knows this picture very well because this is amazing art by Jenny McGee, his, his uh, wife, who's an incredible artist, um, and does incredible work. And she did this uh, mosaic for us here that's on the bag. And then you can see that it comes with the instructions here of how to prepare it. Yeah. And then next time that you get it, we will have your first impact cards that will go out with what's happening. So after the purchase of the first one, then the next one, you'll start seeing the impact cards of what your coffee is going to. So it is actually here. I cannot wait to try it. Woohoo! That is awesome. I actually, yeah, I do not have it yet. And uh, we've been checking, I've been checking the mailbox left and right and even had John run up to the mailbox uh, just recently, just to, like 45 minutes ago to see if it had come yet. Uh, but we're so incredibly stoked about it. Um, and I, you know, knowing uh, Light Bright's coffee, you know, Matt and Megan McNeese that were on with the, with the uh, coffee roastery there, I've never tasted coffee as good as um, um, what, what he's able to uh, select and roast. So I'm pretty stoked. And obviously, I, I, I like the packaging too. It's pretty nice. It's awesome. Yeah. But. Yeah, and the coffee, like Dave said, it's uh, you know it's hand selected from El Salvador from the premium. This coffee one, no, no, this one batch, this batch is actually Guatemala. Guatemala. Oh, okay. Yep. So they'll be so. rotating between Guatemala yep. and El Salvador, but they're hand selected down there. Uh, the high premium, you know, the beans. For, so that it's, even call it, it's actually specialty coffee. Like I didn't know this until like a couple months ago that there's like I don't know what all the different levels are, and you guys can correct me in the comments. Uh, or whatever but like i know that there's like gourmet which is we always i always thought gourmet is like as good as it gets right but even above that it's this other grading of of uh, specialty coffee and uh and it's crazy how much of a legit system there is to like you know uh, be able to figure that out which i saw matt mcneese do when we were in el salvador this cupping process that they were talking about like he had there's this numeric scale from like 70 something to 90 something or whatever and he tasted five different blends or five different beans five different roasts and he like literally was able to say that one is uh honey processed that one's natural processed that one's this and that and then his rating of his ratings of like what it was like 84.5 or whatever was all was within one point of what they had already identified it at so mind blown in terms of of being able to like how much of a science and an art this thing is i love coffee but i've never been a coffee nerd um, but anyhow, I'm pretty stoked about it. I think it's going to be a fun, uh, a fun thing to do. And we are incredibly excited that we get to do this and be able to offer something to you as supporters as well. It's not just, you know, not just the donation that we end up getting to be able to implement, um, in the communities, but also hopefully something that you value as well, being able to have really, really good coffee. So anyhow, guys got to check it out. You know, there is, uh, you know, once again, uh, there is a you know vested interest on our part here. I mean, so let's just be very straightforward, Dave. I mean, if you start your coffee with an, a day with an amazing cup of coffee, and you can think about it last day, come on, absolutely, I mean, that's pretty darn amazing. If that helps you pray, if that helps you do your devotion, sweet, even better. Yeah. But you're going to be starting thinking about people uh, in Central America, um, you know, in Guatemala, in and then obviously, hopefully, in Nepal as well. So. Uh, we, we really appreciate all people signing up. Um, I know there's, uh, there's, I think the first 28 or so Dave signed up and got going and, and I know this is the first round. So yeah. please tell your friends, you know, if you can get three or four people to sign up, then the next batch will go out and, uh, this could kind of get some momentum and we'd really appreciate it. So thank yep. you for, for helping us. Yeah. It looks like the next, next batch is going to go out in mid, mid May. So we've got time to, uh, sign up now, uh, to be able to, to get that rolling. So yeah, I'm stoked. I'm excited. Cool. Likewise. It was awesome. Yeah. Woo! Jenny, coffee, AeroPress, and Lasse. There you go. <laughs> right, um, this is good, man. And um, 
yeah, you guys, please uh, keep engaging on. It's been really awesome to see how many people have engaged with the Facebook Live stuff um, and, you know, keep uh, posting and commenting and, and uh, add, adding questions and comments or suggestions on how we can improve this and how we can just um, be able to serve you guys better and stay connected. That's the whole idea, right? What's in Lasse mean? Connect, link, join relationship all those things and that's what the whole goal of this is is to be able to try and stay engaged with you guys so uh we appreciate you all and uh for, for what you're being able to what the way in which you're you're staying connected even in this crazy and, and difficult time so um why don't we uh pray ourselves out ron um sure. i'll go ahead and pray for us yes okay great god we give you thanks um for your incredible goodness um, in the midst of all the craziness and all the difficulty that so many families are facing, um, not only from um, COVID-19 in terms of the health effects, but also the disastrous economic effects, especially for those people who are already living on such thin margins. And God, um, but one thing that we are sure of is that you are with them, um, that you know them and their situation, and that we know that you are a God of uh, transformation, of transfiguration, um, that uh, when, when we open ourselves up to it, you can take even the worst of the situations and, and transform, them, transform them and transfigure them into something uh, beautiful for your purposes, God. And I just give you thanks that we get the chance uh, to be a part of this, of what your work, what your hands and feet are doing, um, not only in El Salvador and in Guatemala and in Nepal, but also here in the U.S. Um, through so many brothers and sisters and, and partners in the U.S. and the creative ways in, with which they are now partnering with their communities. Um, and God, just thank you that, that in the midst of all of this craziness, we get the opportunity to be able to partner with you um, in something that is just so meaningful of, of bringing your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven in every one of our communities uh, in the United States as it is in heaven. Um, in El Salvador, as it is in heaven, Guatemala, as it is in heaven, Nepal, as it is in heaven, God, that we just give you thanks um, that that is happening, that you, your kingdom is breaking through even in the midst of all this, God. So we just put into your hands all of the pastors, church leaders, community leaders who are sorting out this entire process, God, that you would just lead them, that you would guide them, that you would give them a sense of peace and strength, and that, no, that they would know that they are not alone, that we are with them right now, and that you are with them, God. Um, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Thank man. you, Davisito. Yeah. Let's I'm sure see. we'll probably see you here on a call in, a, in about another 20 minutes or so. <laughs> uh, but, no, thank you, guys. And thanks, Ron, for doing this. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Dave. It's awesome. Awesome. All right. Coffee, Matt, Coffee. Jenny, Aeropress, and Lasse. Don't. <laughs> Go Facebook. All right, that's awesome. <laughs> You're on. That's awesome. It is. It's good. I'm stoked. I gotta see. I don't. I'm trying to figure out how to turn this thing off too. We get. Okay, we, we'll we just keep going. Good Joel back on here. Um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, Facebook Live all day. Yeah. Maybe. Right. <laughs>